Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. I welcome you all to today's session of the Hindu newspaper analysis. A place where we discuss all the important news stories from the day's Hindu newspaper from both the prelims and the mains examination point of view. Also, I have been telling you this every single day and I'll repeat this once again. We are open to help you with one-on-one -on -one counseling session with our experts. If you need any help in your preparation journey, all that you need to do is look at the description of this video. You will find a Google form. Fill up that form and one of our experts will get in touch with you to have a one-on-one -on -one counseling session with you without any cost. These are the topics that we'll be discussing in today's session. From the mains exam point of view, our first article would be about what is happening in Myanmar, specifically in our neighbors. As you know, Myanmar has been under the rule of their military since 2021. And even today, there is no sign of return of democracy in Myanmar. In that aspect, what is the current situation? What is India's stand? This is what this article is about. Second article is about how Aadhaar-based pay has become mandatory in the Manarega scheme. And the article says it's a bad idea. We'll be discussing what that is. Third article is about China's ties with Africa. Now, as you know, Africa is one of those places where the entire world is focusing, including India. China also has made a lot of investment and has strong trade ties with Africa. We'll be discussing what exactly is the status of Africa-China ties and the implication that it has for India. Then, what are RBI's guidelines for the guarantees given by the state government? There are recent guidelines that have been released by the RBI saying that the state should control the amount of guarantees that they give. From prelims exam point of view, the first article is about encryption. How does it work? As you know, if you have read computer science, even at the most basic level, you would know how encryption works. Usually when you're transmitting information from one place to the other, this is what this article is about. Next, there is an article about a new bird species, the laughing girl that has been spotted in India for the first time ever. Then there's an article about how cancer care may be transformed in the coming years due to a new discovery. And in the end, Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger have quit the West African bloc. These are the countries where the rule of the military has come back. These countries have also been in the news for a lot of negative reasons. Let's analyze these one by one in detail, starting with the first one. The first article is about what is happening in Myanmar. Now, before we begin, let me give you a background context of what is happening in Myanmar, what exactly is it that pertains to India. So Myanmar is a neighboring country of India, multiple Indian states share a border with Myanmar. Myanmar has a long history of military rule. Their military is called Hanta. Now you write as J-U-N-T, but the pronunciation is Hanta, her. So Myanmar has been under the rule of their military, that is Hanta since Feb of 2021. So almost three years have been completed since the country is under the rule of the military. Myanmar, interestingly, has had a long history of military rule. This is not the first time that they are under the rule of the military. Myanmar military has had an habit of overthrowing the elected government and gaining power by saying that we want the betterment of the people. And this is what they did here as well. The Myanmar military in 2021 said that we want the betterment of our country, the politicians are corrupt, so we want to come to power. Now, whenever the military comes to power, their argument is that we will stabilize the country and then we will set up democracy. But just like anywhere else in the world, no one wants to give away power. This is what is happening here. The difference, however, is unlike in the earlier instances when the military used to come to power, they used to control the entire country. Now what has happened? Military is finding it extremely hard to control the entire country. A lot of opposition people have formed their own army. Tribals also have formed their own military and they're fighting against the Myanmar military. So right now the situation in Myanmar is the official Myanmar military, the Hanta, is on one side. Then there are the tribal groups that have formed their own armies that are fighting against them. Then the opposition parties or all the parties, the political parties combined, that used to be in the parliament, they have also formed their own military group and they are also fighting against the Myanmar military. So all in all, it is a very, very unstable situation in Myanmar right now. Officially, the control is still with the Myanmar military, but large part of the country is not controlled by the military. 
large part of the country is beyond their control. It is under the control of the tribal groups, under the control of the military that is formed by these political parties. Now, this is the context in which this article has been written. So, ever since the Myanmar military took over the power, the political parties thought, let us combine, join our power to fight against the military first. Once, let's get rid of the military and then we can have our elections. So all the political parties came together and formed something called the National Unity Government. They made their own force called the People's Defense Forces, that is the PDF, to fight against the Myanmar military. On the other hand, there are certain tribal groups that have formed their own force, as I said. One of them is called the Arakan Army. Arakan Army, along with the National Democratic Alliance Army, they have been coordinating against attacks against their own military and they have taken over control of a large number of important areas. Now, this is where India enters the scene slightly. There is a small town in Myanmar called Palitwa. This Palitwa town right now is under the control of the Arakan army. It is not under control of the Myanmar military. Now, why is this important to India? You would have read about this. India has invested in Myanmar in a very important project called the Kaladan Multimodal Project. The Kaladan Multimodal Project. Those of you who know it, great. Those of you who don't know, let me show you what this project is. So, this is the Kaladan Multimodal Transit Project. So, the idea is, we wanted to make sure that we have better connectivity to our own northeastern states. So, if this is Mizoram, to connect Mizoram to Kolkata, we had to go all the way across Bangladesh. That was one option. Bangladesh did allow us a transit route from here sometimes, but again, we did not want to be dependent on them. We wanted to make sure there is an alternate connectivity to our own northeastern state. So India came up with this idea of building this Kaladan multimodal project. So the idea was connect the port here from Kolkata to the Sitwe port here in Myanmar. Then there is a river called the Kaladan River. As you can see here, this is the Kaladan River. This Kaladan River will connect this to a place called Palitwa. Then there will be a highway that will be built and the highway will then touch Mizoram. So the idea is from Kolkata we have connectivity to Mizoram through Myanmar. But for that, it's important that the town of Palitwa is safe and secure. Now, this town right now is not under the Myanmar military. It's not under the official ruling military of Myanmar. It's under the tribal army. This is where now there are concerns for India. Because what has India done? Since Feb 2021, ever since the Hanta, the military of Myanmar took over power, we have not really taken a side to be true. India has not openly said that we support the political parties or we support the Myanmar military because India right now is playing the game in such a manner because we know that either of the two can come back to power tomorrow and we don't want to spoil a relationship with either of the two. So we have not openly criticized the Myanmar military. We still have a diplomatic relationship with them. On the other hand, we don't want to give a signal to the political parties that see, we are only favoring the military. So India is in a tough spot right now because we have invested a lot of money in this project. We don't want this project to go to waste. But right now, since this part of the country of Myanmar is not under the control of the Myanmar military, now we have to see what side does India take going forward. Now, ever since the coup has happened, and when I say the coup, that means the military coming to power in Feb 2021, there has been a lot of protest across Myanmar. Again, this is very unlike what used to happen earlier because Myanmar has had a long history of being under military rule. But now that people have become more empowered, now that people understand that they might get international support also, this is when you see locals protesting against their own military. So, for example, military is losing its support. See, when a country is under the military rule, one of the things that the military is very concerned about is recruitment because when the military is fighting this long war they have to recruit people time and time again Myanmar military right now is facing a shortage of people who are interested in recruitment because a lot of people in Myanmar are not fed up of the military they want to go back to democracy so military is not just facing opposition from the political parties but they're also facing a crunch in a recruitment 
that is again a problem many people in the military have even resigned many people have surrendered in fact many people from Myanmar military have surrendered and they have come to India to the northeastern part of India asking for refuge refuge so again it's a very complex situation in our neighborhood and as you know whenever there is a complex situation in a neighborhood one country has to feature and that country is China what is China doing all about it now China has been a big supporter for Myanmar in terms of military aid etc if you look at the Myanmar military most of the weapons that they use most of the financial support that they get is through China now what is China doing about it now China has been supporting military in the sense that they have made sure that there are no international sanctions on Myanmar because usually what happens whenever there is a country under military rule you will see a lot of western countries putting sanctions on those countries but China has been able to ensure that there are no sanctions as such on Myanmar on the other hand China has also understood that they can control Myanmar in this situation so basically what has happened China understands the fact that right now the situation in Myanmar is extremely critical and any of the two sides that is the political side or the military side can come over the other and China can determine who will win in this case so what is China doing about it so basically China has used this ethnic alliance to stamp out the online scams that were running from Myanmar so basically there is a history that from Myanmar there were a lot of scams online cyber frauds that used to run that used to impact a lot of Chinese citizens these scams are mainly run by the tribal population China used to be fed up by it and they have also taken action against them so they have now sorted at least that part those people who used to scam people in China living in Myanmar they have been taken out by China apart from China there are some other factors at play as well ever since Myanmar came under military rule the international community was demanding what is ASEAN doing about it as you know ASEAN that is Association of Southeast Asian Nations ASEAN includes Myanmar as well ASEAN takes great pride in being democratic in talking to each other resolving their disputes peacefully but they never spoke a word against Myanmar military so there were a lot of protest and pressure on ASEAN why are the ASEAN leaders not speaking up against Myanmar at least for now ASEAN has articulated a five point consensus and they have denied Myanmar military a place in its summit so whenever there is an ASEAN summit governments are invited in ASEAN amongst all the members if you look at Myanmar Myanmar does not have an official government Myanmar will be represented by the military so ASEAN denied them they said that no if you have to send someone to the ASEAN summit send your president we can't have a military leader so at least they have boycotted the military from participating in the summit but again not a lot has been done by ASEAN it was expected that they should have taken a much more stricter stand if they are so concerned about people of Myanmar they should have threatened Myanmar that we will get you or we will ask you to go out of ASEAN but they have not done that the only thing that ASEAN has done right now is not invited military leaders to their summit now comes the most important point from our point of view that is India what is India doing about it as I told you India has not taken one side specifically we have not said that we openly support Myanmar military or we openly support the political parties India usually repeats the generic statement that we keep on repeating in the conflicts that generic statement is we want ceasefire we want negotiations we want peaceful discussions so on and so forth so you don't see any specific statement coming in from India however as per the author here India has to consider three factors number one the discontent against the coup is not dying means there is an increasing amount of discontent increasing voices against the Myanmar military so India should not go very close to Myanmar military because it will harm us in the long run second despite the absence of a big leader and meaningful international support resistance to coup has been solid in the past few years so there is no one single face of the group that is opposing the Myanmar military they don't have a renowned leader even then the support is not dying which means that the common public 
is now against the military. The common public is supporting agitation against the military. So if India wants to maintain good relationship with Myanmar in the long run, we have to listen to their common public. Third, Myanmar is politically fragmented with army, other ethnic organizations, etc. But military seems to be losing the ground. Now, one of the reasons why the Indian government never spoke against Myanmar military was, see, India and Myanmar share a long border. And this is a border in which or around which there is a lot of insurgent activities that India has faced. For example, the current issue in Manipur, even in this issue there are allegations that there are some connections to Myanmar. That people from Myanmar illegally are coming into Manipur, they are also taking part in violence. Because India wants the support of the Myanmar military to catch insurgents who are hiding in Myanmar against India, India usually does not take a stand against the military of Myanmar. Please understand India's situation. If this is the border, this is India and there are insurgents attacking the Indian armed forces and when armed forces retaliate back, they hop on the border and they go to Myanmar, hide there. For this situation to work out in India's favor, we want support from Myanmar military to help us carve out or to help us get these insurgents out. That is why India does not openly take a stand against Myanmar. Now, if you look at Myanmar's military, and I told this to you earlier as well, Myanmar is no stranger to military rule. They have been under military rule for a very, very long time. Myanmar was under the rule of the British, very similar to India. In fact, so much so, and I will just remind you from your modern history classes, so much so, till the government of India Act 1935, Please remember this. Till the government of India in 1935, before that, all the acts that the British introduced for India were for India and Myanmar combined. It was called Burma at that point of time. Government of India in 1909, 1919, etc. All these acts were applicable to India and Burma. It was only in government of India in 1935 that the British introduced a separate act called Government of India Act and the Government of Burma Act. So it was very close if you look at the history of the two sides. From 1962 till 2011, it was the armed forces that ruled over Myanmar. They, under international pressure, the military of Myanmar had to let go. But even then, the military of Myanmar made sure that they make some changes in the constitution. Changes such as 25% of the total seats in the parliament are reserved for the military. So basically elections happen in only 75% seats. Remaining 25% seats are filled with military representatives only. The biggest political party led by Aung San Suu Kyi is the NLD, National League for Democracy, that won the election in 2015. Highly popular party, but the military did not like them being in power for such a long time and that is why the military again came back to power in Feb 2021. From India's side, if you look at our stand in Myanmar, as I said, India has given generic statements that we are concerned about what is happening in Myanmar, we want ceasefire, but you will never openly see a statement from Indian government that openly criticizes the Myanmar military because we know that we need their help to bring out the insurgent in hiding in Myanmar. But now since the situation seems to be changing, since the military seems to be losing ground in Myanmar, it is time for India to reevaluate its process. That is what this article is all about. Moving on to the second article for the day. The second article for the day is about the Manarega scheme. Now, I am sure all of you are aware of the Manarega scheme. Just in case you don't know, the bit of background is Manarega is a rural employment guarantee scheme. The generic statement of the scheme is if you are living in a rural area, the government of India promises you that in a year you will get at least 100 days of paid unskilled labor work. At least 100 days of job guarantee. It is unskilled labor. Unskilled labor means it's just manual labor, uh, digging up something or basically shifting stuff from one place to the other. And the government guarantees you that at least 100 days you will get this. Now, if you look at the scheme, it has been able to achieve its objective in multiple ways. Number one, the objective of the scheme was to give employment opportunities, especially in off-season when they don't have agricultural activities. That has served the purpose. Second objective was to stop or to reduce migration of people from rural to urban areas. That has also happened. Third very interesting point about Manarega. 
Manrega has one third jobs reserved for women. So at least one third jobs will be given to women. But in reality, over 50% jobs are given to women. So it has been a success in that regard. Now, if you look at what has happened here, there has been a problem in Manrega because when the scheme first started, when it first started, the scheme was about giving cash payment to the laborers. So if you worked for a day, your labor, let's say is 200 rupees, you will be given cash. Now, when there's a cash transfer, that becomes problematic because there will always be corruption. The officer responsible for giving cash might not give the cash to the labor. They might not give the exact information to the labor. They might tell the labor that no, your payment was only 100 rupees and may keep the payment with themselves. So there has been a problem in that regard. So governments over the years have tried to change the way in which the payment is given to the workers. The other problem is many workers have multiple job cards. So if you want to work under one nigga, you have to have a job card. So they have multiple job cards, etc. In the past few years, the government has made it a point that they cannot be a cash, there cannot be a cash exchange. The money will go to your bank account only using the Aadhaar, using your mobile uh, number, using your bank account, etc. That has worked very well. Number of or the amount of money that used to just go away, waste or eaten up by corrupt people in between, it has reduced drastically. But now a slight other problem has started. See what the government has done now, since the 1st of January, that is beginning of this year, the government has made Aadhaar based payment system mandatory in Manarega. Now, this is something that many people do not agree with. And this is what this article is about. I've told this earlier as well, and I'll repeat this. Editorial articles are opinion pages. Opinion pages means the author is writing his opinion. So the opinion of the author here is that this is a bad idea. We should not have Aadhaar based payment system. Now we'll discuss what is Aadhaar based payment system, how does it work and what are the pros and cons. So let's try and understand this. Right now in Manarega, there are two ways in which workers get paid. One way is account based and second is this Aadhaar based payment system. So let's first understand the account based system. Account based system means the wages will be transferred to your name, your bank account number, IFSC code has to be matched. You have to give all these details and the money will be given to your account. Now the problem with this system, the government says is that many people change their bank accounts. Many people close their bank account. Many people move from one place to the other. So they can't operate that bank account, so on and so forth. So government said that we want to change this system and thus they opted for the new system. It is Aadhaar based payment system. Now, what is this system? First for this system to work, the workers Aadhaar number must be mentioned in their job card, the Manrega job card. Second Aadhaar must be linked to your bank account also. And third Aadhaar number should be mapped correctly with the bank account number and the National Payment Corporation of India should be able to make sure that this is the correct number. They will have to authenticate it. So in simple terms, the new system, make sure that until you have Aadhaar, which is registered in your bank account and the same Aadhaar should be registered in your job card as well. Only and only then you will get paid. Now, what is the problem here? The problem here is if any of these steps do not work, then you will not get paid. Now the problem starts here. You all know when you go and get your Aadhaar card made or any government ID made, there is a very high probability of your spelling of your name being spelled incorrectly of some detail going wrong. I'll give you a personal example. I'm sure it has happened with everyone. It usually used to happen much more in our earlier generation. So my grandfather, his name was Amir Singh. Now, I don't know why this name, he was not rich, but anyway, his name was Amir Singh. So what happened was he had this uh, Russian card made. In the Russian card, his name was spelled as this. And in the voting ID that they had, that he had, his name was spelled as this. So this was the name spelled in the Russian card. In the voter ID card, his name was spelled like this. So when he tried to make his Aadhaar card became very problematic because in Aadhaar card, he was not sure which spelling to go ahead with. Now imagine a worker, a worker whose bank account mentions this name, but Aadhaar card mentions this name. 
just for this spelling mistake, the worker will not get paid because there is a mismatch. Now, do you understand this? This is where the problem starts. The worker may have to spend hundreds of rupees and lose their livelihood just because of certain technical glitches. Now, why is the government doing this? The government says that it will allow us to make the system even more efficient. The government says in the long run, even if the worker changes the bank account, as long as they have the same Aadhaar number, they won't have to worry about anything. Even if they change the cities, it will not really have a problem. But the authors don't agree here. The authors say that there's a better way of doing this. There's a better way of not just making them dependent on spelling mistakes, etc. You can't take away a worker's right to earn money just because of spelling mistake, just because of certain technical glitches here. The government says that this will allow us to remove all the fake job cards as well. But as per the author, this might not really be the best way forward. There are some data that is given. In the last two years, job cards of 7 crore people have gotten deleted. Government's own data says that out of 25.6 crore registered workers, only 16.9 are eligible for this system. While the other ones are not even eligible for this system. So how do you make sure the others also get the money paid? That is where the government has to take a step back as per the author. The government also says that payment transfer using Aadhaar based payment system will be quicker. But the authors say that we have done a proper study of all the accounts and we have found out that only in 3% cases, only in 3% cases the payment transfer through Aadhaar system was quicker. So the government's claim that the payment transfer will be quicker, that is wrong, it has not been proven. So why are you taking this chance? Why are you forcing the people who in many cases would be illiterate to be dependent on these technical glitches. That is where the author says that this is not really a good idea. Now, please uh, remember this part. This Aadhaar based payment system is not a new idea. It's something that the government had thought about many months ago, but under the pressure from the workers and worker union, the government just kept on delaying it. Now from the 1st of Jan, they have implemented it. So it's not something that they've implemented it overnight. Also, there are some key pointers about this Aadhaar based payment system that you must remember. Number one, the first advantage, beneficiary does not need to update account number time and time again with the change in location, etc. Because your Aadhaar card is linked, as per your Aadhaar card, the money will be transferred. Whichever bank account carries the Aadhaar card number, you will get the money in that Aadhaar card. Second, the National Payment Corporation of India will handle this according to them. The success rate of transferring money to Aadhaar card based payment system is much better. It's about 99.55% as compared to other system, which is 98%. Now, there's not a lot of gap, but this is what they claim. It also is helping the government to ensure that the fake job cards are removed. Also, out of the total 14.3 crore active beneficiaries, Aadhaar has been seeded in 13.97 crore. Now, this data I've taken from PIB. Please understand since this data I've taken from PIB, that means the government will obviously only give the positive data. Why would the government publish some negative pointers about their scheme? So these are the government's point of view that this is the advantage of Aadhaar based payment system. But again, as per the author, you are pushing the workers to a situation where they might be dependent on a few technical glitches to get the payment for the hard work that they have done. These are the challenges. Number one, it might lead to deletion of job cards just because your Aadhaar card spellings etc are not correct. It goes against the right to work because again the registered workers who do not get the Aadhaar card right will be ineligible to get jobs under the Manrega scheme. It will exclude a lot of workers. For example, till December 2023, 12.7% of active workers were not eligible due to technical adaptness for proper documentation. And obviously there are privacy concerns. The more you go online, the more data you collect, the more you map Aadhaar with other things, it will always be a concern whether or not the data will be secured in the long run. Moving on to the third article. Third article for the day is about the growing intimacy between China and the African nations. Africa is one part of the world where all the countries have shown a great deal of interest, including India. 
In fact, if you look at what India has been doing with Africa, and we'll discuss that in just a bit, we have been holding India-Africa summits. We have also pushed for inclusion of G of uh, the African Union in the G20. But even then, if you compare that with what China is doing, China seems to be pretty much ahead of the collaboration that they have formed with the African countries. The context of this article is that recently there was a visit of Chinese foreign minister to four African countries, Egypt, Tunisia, Togo and the Ivory Coast. Egypt, as you know, is one of those countries that share a border with Gaza. So China also announced that we would like to play the mediator role in between Israel and Hamas. Thus, they want to expand their presence as a global power. Now, if you see the history of China-Africa relation, this is not new. In fact, China has been keeping a very keen eye on Africa for a very, very long time. China has always understood that Africa can be a key market for their products and it is true. Africa can also be a key investment destination for the Chinese money and thus China understands the importance of Africa. Not just this, Africa usually votes as one big block in the UN as well. So whenever they want any reforms in the UN, Africa is something that can help them get there and that is what China understands. In 1970s, it was the support of African countries that gave the permanent seat in the Security Council to China. The background story is, if you don't remember, when the UN was first formed and the permanent member, one of the permanent members was China, it was actually Taiwan. Today's Taiwan that you see, that was a permanent member. After the Chinese Communist Revolution, when the Communist Party ruled over China, there was a debate about who should get this permanent seat. Today's Taiwan or today's China. It was only after a lot of discussion that China was given this seat instead of Taiwan and they got the support of African countries also in this. China has also invested a lot of money in Africa starting from the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013 where 52 African countries were the signatories. China has disbursed loan of over 170 billion dollars. It's a humongous amount. They have given loan of over 170 billion dollars to different African countries. Not just this. China also has its first international base in Djibouti. It's a huge international base that China has made to keep an eye on the activities in this part of the world. Now, what are they trying to achieve? It's the same with every country. It's not that China is trying to achieve something different. Even if I write what India is trying to achieve in Africa, what Japan is trying to achieve, it will all be the same. First, obviously, the resources. See, it is very well known around the world that while other parts of the world have exploited most of their land resources, Africa still is home to a lot of important resources. For example, 90% of the world's cobalt, platinum, 75% of coltan, all of this is grown in Africa. China is a huge market for this because China is a leading producer of electronics in the entire world. Not just this, Africa also has their own global aspirations. Africa also wants that their voice should be heard at the international level and they think that China can help them out as a permanent member of the Security Council. Next very important point that many people ignore. China wants that their currency should be at par with dollars at the global level. They want that the place of dollar as a reserve currency should be taken over by the Chinese Yuan. This is also where Africa can play a very important role. China is encouraging Africa to trade in the Chinese currency to get Chinese bonds called the Panda bonds which will allow them to raise money from China at a lower rate of interest. China has even restructured the debt of some African countries such as Zambia if they offer to repay in Chinese Yuan only. So China is giving a push to make sure that their currency is accepted by a wider range of countries including in Africa. Then the other part is about Chinese products and their market. Now Chinese products as you know are very cost competitive. So their products will always be sold in high numbers in those countries which are price sensitive. That is the reason why Indians love Chinese products. The reason is not so much for quality but for the price point. Similarly when you go to a developing country, least developed country where they want to buy products that are lesser in cost, the Chinese products can actually get a very big advantage and that is what happens in case of Africa here as well. This investment or this visit rather that Chinese foreign minister had to the four African countries is to 
improve and strengthen China's foreign direct investment in the region. China, in fact, has been building a lot of infrastructure here as well. Let me give you your homework here while I'm at, at this question. Let me give you your homework here. So search about this. There is a country in Africa whose airport entirely has been built by China. Now, this country has been given a push at the international level by China. China has a lot of investment in that country. China has been has built that airport also. Because of Chinese pressure, a very big leader of that country became a head of an international organization also that was in the news. You have to tell me the name of that country and solve all this puzzle in the comment section. I'll repeat once again. So there's an African country where China has invested a lot of money. They have built their entire airport, that is China. Under Chinese influence, a leader of that country, a political leader, got to become a leader of a very renowned world organization as well. And it became a matter of great controversy in the past few years. Do tell me the name of that country and the Chinese connection there as well. Not that difficult to find out. Tell me in the comment section. I do read all your comments. I read the yesterday's comment as well. Yes, it was Madame Curie who got the Nobel Prize along with her husband with the person on whose name the unit of radioactivity has been named. Anyways, let's go ahead then. Now, apart from China focusing on Africa, as I said earlier, it's India also that is not taking a step back. We have also been focusing a lot on Africa for great reasons. See, China, just like India, realizes the importance of Africa in terms of the growing market in terms of the influence of the African bloc as such in the UN. And that is why you saw in the G20 hosted by India, it was India who proposed the African Union should be a part of the G20 and we were able to successfully do that. We also host regular India-Africa summits. We have been supplying a lot of stuff to Africa, especially pharmaceuticals, vaccines, etc. And we hope that this partnership that we have goes ahead in a direction where India gets to have more say in the way that the African industry works. In fact, a lot of Indian companies have a great presence in Africa. I'll give you some names you might not uh, be familiar with this. Bajaj, TVS, Airtel. All these are huge companies in Africa. All these have a great network. They have great sales in Africa. These are very, very familiar with Africa and the African market. India has reached a trade positive trade balance also with Africa. We have been helping them with scholarships, with uh, building of important infrastructure under the ITEC program as well. We have been granting them help with agriculture development as well. We have been helping them with affordable generic medicines. India is anyways the hub of generic medicine production. So all these things indicate that India understands the importance of Africa going forward. Even in the form of defense, India understands its importance. We just had the India-Africa defense dialogue in which the two sides talked about how we can collaborate. India sees a market for our weapons to be sold to Africa. Because see, India has been increasing our defense production and we want to find out nations that would be interested in taking our products. We have also been helping them with setting up better fiber optic cable network. We have also been launching e-Vidya Bharti, e-Arogya Bharti projects for free education to African students as well going forward in the coming years. The next article that we have here is about the recent guidelines by the RBI on the guarantees given by the state. Now what are state guarantees? Let's try and understand. State guarantee in simple terms is, let's assume that someone takes a loan from the bank. The bank says that we don't trust you whether you will be able to pay back the money or not. We want a guarantor. So the state government says, okay, I guarantee that if this person is not able to pay the loan back, I will give you the money. This is called a guarantor. So what is happening is a lot of state governments are acting as guarantors for a lot of loans, especially the loans taken by different government departments. This is where it is becoming problematic. RBI says that when the government acts as a guarantor, you and when the loan does not fall or is not repaid, the government has to repay it. That means you are paying it from the taxpayer's money. See, I gave my taxes to the government to build roads. I paid my tax to the government to build hospitals. I did not pay the tax to the government so that government can repay someone else's loan. 
Are you understanding it? So when the government acts as a guarantor, that okay, I will repay the loan, you don't have to worry, that becomes a problem. Because the government is now misusing the power, misusing the money that they have collected from the people. So RBI says that this is a practice that has to be controlled because increasing number of states are acting as a guarantor. This has become problematic. Again, when you say that the government has become the guarantor or it's called a surety, that means the government has to pay from its own pocket in case the loan goes back. Now, why do you need a guarantor? As I said earlier, guarantor is required when the bank is not satisfied that you would be able to pay the loan back. So usually it is given for concessional loans to public sector enterprises. When the, gov when the bank thinks that the project is not viable, when the bank thinks that you will not be able to pay the loan back, this is when the government has to act as a guarantor. The RBI panel says that in the event that the loan goes back, this will put undue pressure on the government. The government has to make place for it in their budget. The government will not be able to spend on their welfare schemes just because they acted as the guarantor in certain loans. This is why the RBI has given certain guidelines. Now, what are the guidelines? First, the guidelines say that the guarantor process or the government guarantee should not be used to get finance from state-owned entities. Means... For example, if you are taking a loan, you don't take a loan from the government bank and then act as a guarantor. Because then the government will not even pay money. Government guarantee should only happen when you are taking a loan from a private bank or from a private entity. You should not act as a guarantor while taking a loan from a state-owned entity. Because that will impact the budget of the government even more. Also, they should not be allowed to create a direct liability on the state. The state government should be careful that they should not allow this guarantee process to go out of hand. It also recommends guarantee should be given only for principal amount and normal interest and not the increased interest. Guarantee should also not be given for external commercial borrowings. Again, these are just guidelines. The problem with guidelines is that these are not laws. So if the government wants to do it, because they think that it will help them politically, they will do it no matter what. These are just guidelines to help the state government especially to have a better fiscal health so that they don't just keep on guaranteeing time and time again that, okay, you go ahead and take a loan, we will guarantee you. Also, the RBI says that we can ask the government banks and MBFCs, etc. to disclose which are the loans where the government has acted as a guarantor. So government cannot hide this information. The state government guarantees can be asked by the RBI. RBI can ask which are the specific loans where the state government has acted as a guarantor. And if the RBI thinks that there are certain loans that were at risk where the government acted as a guarantor, they will flag this and there might be some action taken against the bank or against the NBFC. They have also said that the end decision to give a loan or not has to be with the bank or the NBFC only. So they should not come under political pressure. They should only give a loan if they think that yes, the money will return. They should not just give a loan blindly just because the state government is acting as a guarantor. There's a lot of data as well. Which are the states which have given a lot of guarantee as compared to what their GDP of the state is. For example, Andhra Pradesh, Sikkim and Telangana are the three states where the amount of guarantee that they have given is over 10% of the state GDP. Means, for example, let's just take a random example. Let's assume if Telangana's GDP is 1 lakh crore, okay? Then Telangana has given a guarantee of over 10,000 crore. So just imagine if these loans go back bad and, care, and Telangana government has to give it from their own pocket, how much of a dent it will be? These states, Andhra Pradesh, Sikkim, Telangana, they have exceeded 10% of their state GDP in just giving guarantees, which is not a good way going forward. Also, this is how the finances from the states have changed over the years. Market borrowings have increased considerably because again, the state governments have been misusing this provision of giving guarantee 
and that is why they just take loan from the market, guarantee from their consolidated fund of the state, and that becomes a problem in the long run. RBI does not want that guarantee provision to be misused. Now moving on to some of the articles from the prelims examination point of view. First one about encryption. Now encryption is a word that I'll, almost all of you would be familiar with. Just in case you don't know, let me give a simple example. If you are given the SSC exam or the bank BO exam, there are some questions, logical reasoning questions, for example, which says if Apple is equal to uh, 39847, then what is orange equal to? You see these kind of questions. So what is happening here? The word Apple has been encrypted in some other form so that no one else will be able to understand. If you say I am buying five apples, everyone will know. But if you say I am buying five 39,845, no one will be able to understand what you're talking about. So that is the primary purpose of encryption. Encryption means changing the information in such a manner that no one gets to know what that information contains. So that when you're communicating with someone online, even if someone hacks into your system, they will not be able to decipher what that information is. That is called encryption. Encryption usually is based on certain standards. For example, data encryption standard will change the word ice cream into this random phrase, whatever it is. It will change the word motorcycle into this. So that this encryption makes sure that your information is safeguarded. For example, let's say you are sending a WhatsApp to someone, you texted a message. The message that you text when it reaches your friend's mobile phone, it is only your friend's mobile phone that will be able to understand what that message is. If someone in the middle tries to intercept, even then they will not be able to understand the message because it is encrypted. Now there are different types of encryptions. There is something called E2E. E2 E2E is, means end to end. End to end encryption. End to end encryption means message is encrypted both in the transit and at the rest. So for example, if you see this, this is called end to end encryption, which is a better way to encrypt a message. So you send a message, it is encrypted, it goes to the server and then from the server, it goes to the user where you wanted to send the message and only the user will be able to understand this. This is called end to end encryption. On the other hand, there is one more encryption, which is called the other form that is encryption in transit. Encryption in transit means before a message is relayed from the server to you, it is encrypted. Means, let's say you send the message to the server, at that time it will not be encrypted. Server will encrypt it and then you will send it to the end user. This is where encryption in transit comes into the picture. This is slightly tricky because this is where it gives a chance to the hacker to actually hack in between. This is where the server acts as a weak point. Now, if you are not from this background and you are having a difficulty in understanding how encryption works, my advice is don't worry about that. The UPSC does not go into such technicalities to ask this question. As long as you understand the concept of encryption, as long as you understand that encryption basically safeguards your information, it makes sure that only the person to whom you are sending the information can read it properly. Anyone in the middle, even if they intercept, will not be able to read the information. That is called encryption technique. That is good enough for you. I'll give you even a simpler example. <clears throat> you all have Wi-Fi at your place. Most of you would. You have a Wi-Fi router. You usually keep a password for your router, right? Only when you input the password, you would be able to connect to your Wi-Fi router. That is also a kind of encryption. Anyone who does not have that password will not be able to understand how because the signal that your router is sending, that signal can be unlocked or via a key. That key is called your password. Similarly, the WhatsApp message that you send to your friend can only be understood by your friend's mobile phone because your mobile phone of the friend only will have that key. That is how encryption usually works. So there are different ways in which encryption would work. There are ways in which you can send message from one person to the other. There are ways in which you can connect to certain machines. These are different forms of encryption. For example, there are asymmetric and symmetric encryption, as I said earlier. In symmetric encryption, the example that I gave you, 
the example that I gave you that is if you have the key you will be able to get hold of that information only that person will be able to understand what is the message that you are sending also symmetric encryption would allow you to get information stored with you for example to connect to a router to lock your mobile phone when you have a mobile phone you put a lock on that only you are able to open that up because you know the key all that is called symmetric encryption on the other hand asymmetric encryption would be when you send a message to some other person mobile phone and their whatsapp would be able to understand that now can these encryption be cracked see in reality there is no encryption technique in the world that cannot be cracked because whenever you develop a technique there is always someone smarter than you always someone who is trying to hack into your system in reality there is no technique that cannot be hacked it just depends how long will it take to hack into the system for example there is a process called man in the middle attack man in the middle attack would be when you are sending your message from your whatsapp to your friend's whatsapp a server in between will be able to and will be able to hack into that message in the middle he or she will be able to get your encryption key either by hacking into your device or by understanding what your your friend's device is doing and they will be able to decrypt the message thus to say that any encryption is 100% full proof is wrong yes with emerging technologies with better encryption we are making it difficult for the encryption to be unlocked but yes it will take a longer period of time if you have adequate machines if you have adequate algorithms but you will be able to crack into encryption it just depends upon how long will it take to carry out such an attack or to understand such messages the next article that we have here is about a new bird species spotted for the first time in india called the laughing girl this is a migratory bird that has traveled from north america this time around this has been spotted for the first time in kerala it has been spotted at the chitari ashuri in kasargod district in kerala also the kasargod district has been known to be a place where a lot of migratory birds come in year on year about 1367 birds have been found in india in the kasargod district alone 400 species have been found out so far now what do you have to remember about this species the kind of question that you will get from the exam are about let's say the iucn status where are they found what are their eating habits etc so just remember a few facts the laughing girl it is usually found in the shore lines it is usually uh, dependent on aquatic uh, animals aquatic uh, intervertebrate that is what they usually eat their conservation status is low concern low concern means they have a good number in their population you don't really have to be concerned about that as per the iucn their official status is least concern this is the official status so basically the least concerned population would mean that they have considerable amount of population the population size is very large that is about over 10000 mature individuals and are still counting so thus it's not that they are found in small numbers as it's found for the first time in india specifically next article is about a new discovery that may transform cancer care in the coming years now you all know that a large number of people die of cancer year on year in india around the world it is one of those diseases for which a particular cure that is 100% effective has not been found yes if you detected early enough you do have situations where the people have been treated for cancer but in case a detection is further down the line that is when it becomes problematic now what has happened is there is a new discovery related to the genome sequencing project that allows us to cure cancer in a much more targeted manner the who says that the cancer burden will increase by almost 60% in the next decade or so now again one of the big problems with cancer like disease is the later that you detect it the more problematic it becomes basically if you understand cancer it is a disease of the genome how is it caused it is caused by a process where the cells continue to divide in uncontrolled manner there is an uncontrolled growth of the cells within the body it starts to harm certain organs and that is when 
it is called as cancer. Now there are different ways in which cancer exists. There are inherited genetic variations. So you inherit it with your genes and then there are certain which are acquired also which you don't inherit. For example, breast cancer, ovarian cancer are some of those which can be inherited with genes. So far, we thought that there is no way to stop them. But now advancements in the genome technology have provided a way to stop the cancer that is passed on hereditary from genes. Please understand again, two types of cancer. One is acquired, no cure or no specific advancement found in that. But yes, if there is a form of cancer that is passed on through your genes, there is now a study that says that that can be now cured with the new generation therapy called the target molecular defect. This is also called as precision oncology. Oncology is basically the treatment of cancer. What has happened is around the world, scientists have been running the human genome project. In fact, not just in developed countries, countries such as India are also running their own human genome project. In UK, for example, the 100,000 genome program is running under which they have carried out a study of over 13,000 cancer patients to understand the cancer genomics, to understand what are the genomes that mainly cause cancer and can they take that out before it gets passed on to the next generation. That is where the breaking technology has come in. We have discussed about the human genome project earlier as well and I'll just discuss about that in just a bit. But first do understand there's a difference between gene and genome. While gene is a part of the DNA molecule, genome is the total DNA of the cell. Gene, when you say the word gene, it only talks about the hereditary part. While all the nuclear DNA together is called the genome. The length of the genome is higher in an organism, much higher as compared to any gene. Now, like other countries, India is also in the Genome India project. The idea is to have a sequencing of genome of random population. So the countries around the world are taking samples from their people trying to have a study of their genome to understand who is susceptible to which kind of disease in the coming years so that you can treat that in advance. For example, if we are able to find out that a certain genome exists in cancer patients only, we can take that out using the gene molecular therapy and make sure it does not get passed on to the next generation. So India is also running this kind of a project to have predictive diagnosis to have precise medicines, especially for those kind of diseases going forward. The last article that we have here is about the three countries in Africa, Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger announcing that they will no longer be a part of West African bloc called ECOWAS, E-C-O-W-A-S. Now, these are the three countries that have been in the news because of the control of the military over these countries. These countries have seen a lot of violence, a lot of countries have already imposed sanctions. African Union has also taken action against these countries saying that the military rule in these countries is overthrowing the democracy and we should take it back. Now these three countries under the rule of the military have taken away or have stepped back themselves from ECOWAS, E-C-O-W-A-S. Basically this ECOWAS is an organization that came up in 1975. The idea was to have betterment of the countries in what you call as a Sahel region. Now, the Sahel region of Africa is a region which lies towards the north of Africa. This is the part which was mainly ruled by the French. In fact, French had a military presence in this part of the world for a long, long time. It was created under the Lagos Treaty to have economic integration, cooperation in West African countries specifically. It has been headquartered in Nigeria. This is the block, total of 15 members out of these 15. Now Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger have said that we are coming out. But in total, it had about 15 members. It is towards the west of Africa. This brings us to the end of today's session. Here are a couple of practice questions that you must try and write answers to on a student answer writing portal. And you can check each of the answers as well there. I've given you the homework. Do find it out. Let me know in the comment section which country am I talking about and what is the connection that China has. I hope you learned something new today from today's webinar. I'll see you tomorrow. 
10 a.m. once again. Do join us for the Hindu news analysis. Have a good day ahead. Bye bye. Jai Hind.